quick welcome, aren't you? Yes, Michel, very briefly so, thank you. Um, colleagues, just a very, very quick word of welcome from my side, and thank you for making time um, for attending this session today. I'm not going to say much about what's going to happen. Um, um, a lot of work has gone into the courses that we will be running you through today. Um, I thank you so much for our faculty joining us. We're very proud of, of, of what we'll be presenting today. We think, we believe that many of the topics and the way that we've designed our courses um, and all the credit goes to Michelle, our instructional designer, and the way that we've designed our courses, we really believe we are, we've, we've um, sort of reimagined online learning, digital learning. Our learner experiences have been very, very carefully structured. Uh, Michelle will elaborate on that. Our assessment, our assessments that we're doing on the, the, um, in these courses are different to the usual standard tell us what you know type of assessments. Um, Michelle will also elaborate on that. Um, I, we believe that many of these courses fill niches in the training and develop it, in the in develop training and development environment that haven't been addressed yet. Emmanuel's course, which you will hear about, is a fantastic example, um, and so are a few others. But I've said enough. Just once again, welcome from my side. Thank you for joining us. Um, I will be posting my personal email address sort of during the course of the session on the chat group. If afterwards, if you would like to reach out and if you have any further queries, then please don't hesitate and you can pop me an email. I will most certainly come back to you. Michelle, over to you. Um, thanks and good morning to everybody. My name is Michelle Ballswinkel. I am the digital instructional designer that's been working with all of the faculty you'll be meeting today. Um, the first of the courses we'll be talking about, a very exciting course called Digital U. Um, in this course, faculty Emmanuel Gamor shares his wealth of experience in helping learners to create a digital persona and footprint and then interact online as reputable digital citizens. The course is really aimed at a wide variety of executives, um, as we know that executives are expected to abide by some form of an organizational digital code of conduct. Um, I would like to give you a view of the outcomes and the weeks and module overview. If you can just divert your attention to the week and module overview, you'll see that the first module is called Digital You at Work. Now this module speaks to the first of the course outcomes on the left which is digital engagement competencies for today's world of work. The assignment in week four addresses the last one of those outcomes, which is to develop a plan to ensure that this digital you adheres to an organizational code of conduct. Um, in terms of the learning experience, the picture you're seeing right here has been clipped from video content from Emmanuel. And as you can see, it's really fresh. It's got a nice Gen Z appeal and it makes for a really exciting learning experience. In this, uh, this clipping, Emmanuel shares some practical tips and tools. He talks about circles of influence there in a relatable and a very engaging way. So what will I find if I Google your name? Um, here's what I found when I Googled my name. And it seems that the internet remembers all of our bad hairstyles as well. Um, this is one of the activities that makes the assessment experience for this course so very exciting. So the learner, their peers and a line manager go and actually Google them online and share their insights about what they find in terms of the learner's online presence. But let's hear from Emmanuel himself. Thank you for joining us, Emmanuel Gamor. Um, I have a few questions for you, but I suppose the big burning question is why and how should organizations and their leaders upskill or help their employees to develop their digital you? Thanks so much, Michelle. It's a pleasure to be here and with everybody else. Obviously, I'm incredibly passionate about digital you and it's really one of the foundational courses we believe for digital citizenship. 
as you could attest, the world is incredibly interconnected. We're in a digital era where most of our identities blend from our physical realm into the digital world in a way that it intersects with the world of work, our interests, our passion, and in some spaces, our advocacy as well. The challenge with all of this is that for most of us, it's quite novel to have such a strong intersectionality with what we would do normally in our physical life and things that may show up in digital platforms, some of the more popular ones being the social media platforms, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, uh, Wikipedia, uh, what have you. So what we try to do with this digital U course is to distill and uh, giving you kind of breadcrumbs and guidelines, if you will. And those are kind of hinged in foundational pillars that Michelle and I were able to articulate really in understanding one, how do you have your own agency in presenting yourself? So your digital persona. Uh, but we try to go beyond that as well, because we understand that in this day and age, you may be held accountable for things that you probably didn't even know existed or somebody in your close external circle posted about you the digital reputation management piece. And through some of the exercises that are fun, relatable, engaging to do, you find that you now have a level of agency in portraying the best version of you, your digital citizenship, not just to the rest of the world, but in particular to your employers and potential employers as well. I think you would also find um, that one of the core pillars of this has to do with a social media code of conduct, if you will. And the way it's designed is to help employers, employees have a conversation around that. Most companies don't clearly articulate what the code of conduct is, particularly for folks who work and what that looks like with their dig digital representation and how they, that may pose reputational risks to the organization. Where we've been able to articulate this in a clear guided way that you can create a digital code of conduct that helps protect not just the company, but also the employee, because you've been part of that conversation. And we've kind of scaffolded that learning journey for you to feel confident in your rep representation through your persona, agency through management, and collaborative ways of managing that through the social media code of conduct with people that employ you, and hopefully people who will be employing in the future. Michelle. Thanks, Emmanuel. Um, if anybody has any questions for Emmanuel or wants to know a little bit more about the course, please can you post your questions in the chat, um, in the chat box, aim at them at Emmanuel, and, and it would be really nice for everybody else to also see the question. So please do that. Emmanuel will be on standby to answer your questions. And then if you have any questions after this session about the marketing for this course, or if you're interested in, in pursuing this course, or Finding out more, you can please direct your chat to Dr. Johan Swanepoel, who is also here with us today. He's the head of our digital channel, or Bernard Taylor, who's also with us today and will be happy to answer your questions. Thank you, Emmanuel. Well, because this is a quick connect, we're literally quickly moving from one faculty to the next. Um, and I'm very happy to have um, Professor Salome van Peter with us today to talk to us about the Advanced Project Management Leadership course. Now, this course builds on our very popular project management principles and practices course. It's aimed at advanced level project managers, those who are upskilling themselves to lead projects at a more strategic level. Now, beyond what is obviously their academic expertise, the faculty team of Prof. Mias de Klerk and Prof. Salumi van Keller, uh, van Koller Peter, also bring years of experience in project management themselves and leading projects at a strategic level. Um, the course outcomes that you see here on the left hand side um, gives you an idea of the practical application of learning to the leader's specific context. On the right are the modules of learning. As you can see, it runs over four weeks. Um, for instance, module four, which deals with the project leader as coach. Um, this is assessed against, you'll see the last course outcome, which is to apply coaching skills and methods to a coaching conversation with a project team member. The learning experience itself is tailored to the advanced level project manager. Now we know that this project manager has to deal with high levels of complexity and uncertainty as the strategic nature of the project really raises the stakes substantially for them. The final course assignment um, comprises four different parts that, that are released sort of on a weekly basis. 
And this allows the learner to work on it as they go through the course and, and tailor it accordingly. Um, the final course assignment asks learners to apply models and theories provided um, by the two profs involved to a strategic level project. For instance, Prof Miaste Clark gives us a dynamic change leadership framework, which the project managers on this course then go and apply to an actual change project in the workplace. Prof um, Van Kolepita, we are allowed, we are very happy to have you with us today, Salomi. Um, I know that you're also representing Prof Miaste Clark in your answer to us today. Um, my question is, how this course specifically develops strategic level leaders, mm. those strategic level leadership skills that, that, that advanced level project managers need. Thanks, Michelle. And I must say it was just a, a wonderful journey with you. You're such a good project leader. So it was very exciting to do this. Um, um, we all know that when you start out with projects, uh, smaller projects, often, Often you are used, we use the, the actual um, expert in the field uh, for the technical knowledge and experience to, to run projects. And often the team is small enough and we can, we can carry that. But we've all learned that the best engineer is not necessarily the best project manager. Since when projects grow into bigger projects, uh, hands off, hands off. Uh, we need to then stand back as leaders of projects and let others do the job while we coach them and we train them and we, we facilitate the resources, we manage conflict and change and all of that good stuff. We keep our eyes on the milestones, um, but it's very important to then already start coaching people so that they can do the run the project and you are the overseer. You make sure all of those things are in place you start building good relationships with others. Um, and your main role starts becoming networking, uh, stakeholder management, building win-win relationships whilst you are grooming others to do your job. Now, even more so when you're a strategic project manager, um, because here yeah, things can get complex and messy. You are now dealing with possibly different departments or different divisions. Uh, you may even deal with different companies as you try and integrate uh, all the work towards the project objectives. And so you might deal with different politics in different organizations, different worldviews, different leadership styles, uh, different languages. Um, and so now it's really, really important that you put your leadership hat on. Hopefully you've developed that all the time to this point where you create the environment within which you allow or you, you tap from others the resources that you need. And we know that a project of this kind has several sponsors and not just one. It's not just the financial oak that gives you the check. It's also people who sponsor you with influence, with knowledge, with goodwill, with uh, people who open doors for you. Um, and it's important to then really, really manage these stakeholder relationships. Whilst uh, now your responsibility towards transformation and managing not just change, but big transformation, like we've seen in COVID last year, um, is, is very, very important. So more and more so you need to now be divorced from the project leadership, because now you've coached people, you've trained them, you've kept them motivated to manage the project for you. So, so the higher up we go, or bigger the project, more strategic the project, with the less we get involved, the more we coach, the more we mentor, the more we, we work across all the levels of stakeholders, as I said, with all the complexities involved. Um, yeah, so I think coaching, mentoring skills are really, really important all along the way, and also team coaching um, skills, because that, in effect, are the, is the skill set or part of the skill set that helps you manage the change. Thanks, Michelle. Thank you so much, Prof, for being here. If anybody has questions for Prof Salumi, she'll be around. So please direct them to her in the chat box. And again, if you're interested in this course further, 
please don't hesitate to ask Dr. Johan Swanepoel to get back to you. Um, we move on then, thank you, Prof, to our next Quick Connect story. And uh, here we'll be looking at the Inspiring Innovation short course. This is a course that we're really excited about. It's unique. It's a uniquely USB ed offering, and it helps a wide range of leaders to obtain the skills and the competencies that they need to inspire innovation, not only in themselves, but in their teams and in their organizations. By the end of this course, leaders will be able to apply processes like design thinking and create a strategically aligned organizational plan to unlock innovation. The course uh, learning experience is, well, it's very creative, as you can expect with a course like this. We have um, three engaging short digibyte videos that provide insight into things like the fourth industrial revolution, creative intelligence, and entrepreneurship. And what these videos do is they land major complex constructs in a simple way, and they give you theories and methodologies that are really informative and very visually appealing, as you can see. In terms of the assessment experience, Dr. De Jager created a detailed innovation plan for us to work with here. She literally, she literally just got everything together in her head, put it down in a plan, which our learners in this course can use to inspire innovation. So um, the assessment experience centers on this innovation plan, completing this and the in the final assignment. So the assessment experience is quite real and very robust for the learners present. We are very thankful to have with us Dr. Sherilyn Diocher. Sherilyn, um, you know, it's, a, it's an easy question with, I'm sure, a difficult answer. Why would you want a course about inspiring innovation? Uh, one would think that creativity and innovation just kind of happens magically. I'm sure if that was the case, then all organizations with, with, will have a culture that supports creativity and innovation and all organizations will have innovation as part of their organizational DNA. But unfortunately, it is easier said than done. Um, the fourth industrial revolution was fast tracked by COVID-19 and this inspired and ignited a renewed interest in creativity and innovation as essential future skills. So, Everybody got onto the bandwagon, let's innovate to remain competitive and to remain relevant in a time of great challenge and great uncertainty. Now, people underestimate the multidimensional complexity of innovation and what is required to plan an innovation intervention that will yield proper results. So this course has put together years of experience and research and with your help and guidance, we have really constructed checklists and templates that will inspire leaders to be aware of all the complexities and the multidimensional take it has to actually put an intervention of this kind together. So where do leaders start? First and foremost, they have to assess their current organizational reality. Does the organization have the determinants to support or block innovation in the organization? Then they need to decide, do we establish these determinants? How do we establish them? And do we remove the blockers if we can? That again in itself is also not sufficient. People need to understand the constructs of what innovation entails. This course also includes unpacking, understanding, and showing the interrelatedness of those constructs. Now, I start from creative intelligence. I'm a specialist in creative intelligence. And creative intelligence is the practical application of creativity and design thinking to inspire innovation in order to address client needs or to solve problems while navigating the fourth industrial revolution and the COVID challenges, and at the same time, shaping the future. A tall order, but it can be done. 
So people need to understand what creativity is all about, the interrelatedness and the connectivity to innovation. So creativity yields ideas, innovation implements it, and design thinking is a tool igniting the ideas to be implemented. Having said that, the next step is for leaders to enhance the creative confidence of individuals so that they can feel safe to generate ideas and to propose solves. <coughs> I beg your pardon. I do have a, a, a slight cold at this stage. So once these ideas are generated, the next step will be to create psychologically safe teams. In order to create psychologically safe teams, leaders need to select the right kind of profiles for these teams. They have to have domain expertise, expertise adjacent to the domain, and then people from totally outside of the domain to come with new perspectives and to challenge and to offer new solutions. Last but not least, leaders now need to be very, very, very honest with themselves with regards to their roles in this innovation intervention. Do they inspire, motivate, drive, lead and implement the innovation intervention? Or do they hand the mandate over to your organizational intrapreneur? Now the organizational intrapreneur is the current latest trend where your entrepreneurs within your organizations are given the right constructs and opportunities within the organization to innovate and to be entrepreneurial while doing it within the brand. And you're the brand specialist, so you will know the importance of doing it within the brand. Because a lot of entrepreneurs in organizations want to stay within the brand. They don't necessarily want to start their own business and become the organization's competition. And on that note, this course actually, and again, thank you so much for your guidance there, is we have provided checklists and a template that will enable a person to actually compile a very detailed innovation blueprint or plan that will not only launch and kickstart your innovation, but will also reignite a stagnant or stale innovation intervention. And last but not least, innovation is creativity commercialized or creativity in a business suit. Thank you for your time. Unmute, Michelle. Unmute self. Thank you, Sherilyn. Um, again, if anybody has any questions for Dr. Sherilyn Diacher about the course, please pop them in the chat box or let Dr. Johan Swanepoel know if we can get back to you about any further details about the course. Um, our next course we're talking about is the Presentation Skills Fundamentals short course. One would wonder why a presentation skills course online. So this is quite unlike anything we've ever seen in practice. The course is aimed at business students and professionals who need the knowledge and skills to conduct a compelling presentation. If you have a look at the course outcomes, you'll see that the outcomes lean on helping learners to apply methods, processes, templates and tools and techniques to their own presentation. There are three modules, as you can see, they're structured around what we've termed the five steps of presenting online or in a face-to-face -face environment. And these are to outline your presentation, plan, prepare, conduct, and review. And then the final assignment is due in week four and it tests your application of those phases. In terms of the learning experience, there's a variety of templates that guide learners as they go through carefully structured learning according to these steps. And what you're seeing in this picture is one of LinkedIn's vast range of videos. So LinkedIn learning is pulled in here where we give you videos into practical or technical aspects of presenting, like this video, which is about the gestures that engage people. We've done some really exciting things with the online assessments for this course. It includes an activity in which learners are required to video record themselves doing a presentation, then post it online and get insights from their peers um, and other people doing the course. And they can then sculpt, perfect and tailor that presentation. 
Uh, unfortunately, our faculty member Sharon Shakun could not be with us today, um, but she has made a very nice video for us in which she introduces herself and talks about. Hi, my name is Sharon Shakung and I'm a management consultant and a learning facilitator. I am faculty lecturer on this Presentation Skills Fundamentals online short course. I've been in leadership development for about half of my 25 year long career. And in that time, I've seen how difficult it can be for even, Apologies. even the best of leaders to deliver powerful and compelling presentations. I've seen leaders compromising their core messages to their target audiences through presentations that are not well planned and not well delivered. Most courses focus on helping people to put together a very good looking set of slides. In this course, however, we will help you to do much more than that. This course will help you to outline, plan and prepare your presentation in order for you to be able to present with confidence. The course also includes an opportunity for you to receive very valuable input from other course participants, while also being able to offer them valuable input from your perspective. The course also includes LinkedIn videos that have been carefully selected to be able to help you with everything from slide design to body language. Completing this course will be a boost to your career. Thank you to Sharon for that. Um, and so this Welcome to the Quick Connect webinar where, in which we introduce our digital or online short courses to you. My name is Michelle Volkswinkel. I'm the hostess today and I'll be taking you through the courses and we'll be connecting live with our faculty members. Again, if you have any questions for our faculty members at the end of their presentations, please pop them in the chat box. They will be happy to get back to you. And if you'd like to find out more about running these courses in your organization, Dr. Johan Swanepoel is your man. He's also available to you and you can chat to him in the chat box. Um, our next course we're discussing today um, is we are very happy to have Dr. John Glenn joining us to talk about the negotiation skills, principles and practices short course. In this course, business professionals can learn how to apply global best practices in negotiation and bargaining. As you can see from the week and module overview over here, uh, the course runs over seven weeks and it unfolds in themes. Now, these themes align with two prescribed books that Dr. Glenn has brought into the course. These are um, a very popular negotiation course, a uh, negotiation book called Getting to Yes. And then also the work of former FBI hostage negotiator, negotiator uh, Chris Voss. The course outcomes reveal the practical application of these themes to real life negotiation scenarios. Learners will be able to, for instance, establish underlying interests, determine objective criteria, and prepare their bat map for a presentation. Dr. Glenn uses his very warm presenting style to decode things like what a bat now means uh, in a full stack of course videos, which are backed by tutorials and activities. To help learners to apply this to their own context, Dr. Glenn also hosts two interactive webinars and two online course tutorials. Learners have called this their favorite part of the course. The course's assignment is also released iteratively so that um, learners can go through the necessary preparation for a principled negotiation as they go through the course and as they get input from Dr. Glenn during their learning journey. We're very happy to have Dr. Glenn join us uh, from the UK, where he's with the Cranfield School of Management. Uh, John, my question to you and this is not just because you're in the UK, but tell us more about the global reach and the accessibility of this course. Okay, so first of all, as you suggested, Michelle, in your introduction, uh, the global reach is, is uh, the foundations of the global reach is reflected in the material that we present. Get Into Yes is the classic text out of Harvard on negotiation. And then Chris Voss's book, is looking at the emotion that exists in negotiation, how you manage that emotion before you can use the techniques that are in getting to yes. 
Also, the global aspect that I bring to it is that I've delivered this program uh, across the world uh, to many, many different organizations uh, in every uh, continent of the, plan of the planet. And so what that allows me to bring is how people in different global contexts have used that material uh, and used it to, to address the specific context in which they have to negotiate. So I can bring lots of examples how of how negotiators across the planet have used uh, this type of material. But what we then try to do is to use that to reflect the experience of, of people who are attending the course, uh, predominantly people in Africa, but those people, many of whom have to negotiate with global counterparties, uh, their experience of how they can use this material uh, to make them uh, much more effective uh, negotiators. So typically, uh, the people that come on our program uh, are relatively senior procurement professionals, their key account uh, managers. We've had legal uh, professionals on the program, both in-house legal professionals and barristers. Um, and many of these people have been negotiators for a long period of time. So what this program is doing to them is to help them make that journey between what I would call unconscious competence. These are people who are very good at what they do, but they don't really understand uh, the structure of what they're doing to what I would call conscious competence. So they understand why they're good negotiators. They have a framework that provides them with a structure to how they approach uh, negotiations. And therefore, they're able to do the things that they do well more frequently, stop doing the things that they don't do well, uh, and start doing things that they should be doing. The second set of people who typically come onto this course are young, early career uh, negotiators. And essentially here we provide them with a framework. You talked about this, what I call this holy trinity of negotiation, understanding people's interests, developing options around those interests, and then using objective standards to support your perspective uh, in a negotiation. And what we find is that that approach provides uh, young uh, early career negotiators with a framework that they can use when they go into negotiation. And much of the feedback that we've received around the course has been around those people feeling more confident. As you said, um, the assessment in this course is based upon uh, the learner's own um, negotiating experience and the application of, of the principles to that negotiation experience reflectively and again, identifying what they do well, what they need to start doing, and what they need to stop doing in terms of their approach to negotiation. So hopefully I've given you an overview of uh, both the global aspect uh, of the program, the type of people who are coming onto this program, and our ability uh, to translate that learning into the challenges that people face uh, in a, on a country basis, on a pan-African basis, and on a global basis uh, when undertaking negotiation. Thank you, John. You've indeed done that for us. If anybody has any questions for Dr. John Glenn, please pop them in the chat box. He'll be happy to answer all about our negotiation skills, principles, and practices online short course. If you'd like to find out more about um, including this course in your array of courses, Dr. Johan Swanepoel is available in the chat box. Thank you, John. We move on in our Quick Connect session to our next uh, course that we'll be talking about managing mental health and wellness at work. This course explores the meaning, the importance and the management of mental health and wellness in the corporate environment. Prof. Renata Skuman is our practicing psychiatrist and faculty member for this. And uh, to mention that the course is endorsed by the Psychiatry Ma Psychiatric Management Group, as well as the South African Society of Psychiatrists. Sure, that's a lot, South African Society of Psychiatrists. We're very proud to have their endorsement for this course. And as you can see, um, one of the reasons that this course is such a gem is that it's aimed at leaders, people at the forefront of managing employees. So these leaders will be equipped um, to be able to recommend preventative measures and supportive approaches to managing mental health and wellness in the workplace. You'll see that the course is very short. It spans two weeks of learning and one week for the course assignment. 
The course is based on a set of video recordings. Um, um, some of you might have been there. It was a 2019 corporate mental health conference, which was held at USB. Um, the panel that you see there were the panel that, uh, that hosted the webinar and provided answers to the, to the deeper issues coming out there, of which one was burnout, for instance. And these panel videos are then explored in great depth in the learning content itself. Due to the sensitive nature, I suppose, of, of mental health disorders, we've created a final course assignment case study. It's a case study of an employee that struggles with ADHD and substance disorders, and leaders are then explored to, to, or challenged to explore this, this particular employee in the case study against their current organizational context. Now, this can include policies, procedures, the culture, and even their own leadership style in applying this case study then to their reality. Prof. Renata Skuman is with us today. This lady was the driving force behind this course. She came to us and she said, we have this amazing conference. We have to take it and put it into a course because more people need access to it. My question for uh, Prof. Renata Skuman today is that why do you believe so strongly that organizations and their leaders need to learn how to manage mental health and wellness in the workplace? Prof. Yeah, I'm muted, Arte. Thank you, Michelle. As a psychiatrist in private practice for about 14 years, and in terms of leadership development and working with corporate mental health in organizations for the past seven years, this new course, Managing Mental Health and Wellness at Work, is actually long overdue. Mental health disorders affect up to a third of individuals. And in South Africa, less than 50% of these individuals get the necessary support and treatment that they should have. But it's not only due to a lack of services. A lot of this has to do with the lack of awareness, but then also the stigma surrounding mental health. We need to reduce this and remove these barriers to care for all individuals. Now, during the past four years, University of Stellenbosch Business School has worked very, very hard in establishing this in corporate organizations through talks and then ultimately the workshops and the courses that you've seen as well. And we remodeled this and explore the content in more depth and, depth and um, elaborate on this in the schools. And what I've seen is although awareness have significantly improved in organizations, very little has changed in terms of policies, procedures and preventative measures in the organizations. And we cannot sit back anymore and think this is an HR issue. Change needs to start at the leaders and it should impregnate all levels of the organization. We need to prevent mental health disorders, or at least we need to identify it early and prevent the emotional and the dire economical impact it has on organizations and even the economy at large. We need to intervene early and we need to prevent this becoming disabilities where people are unable to work or to return to work. So in this managing mental health and wellness course, we leaders would really be equipped to have the tools to at least start these conversations and also to be empowered into developing a mental health strategy for their organization. But finally, we also need to remember that happy and healthy leaders can help to build happy and healthy organizations. Thank you so much, Professor Renata Skuman. Um, if you have any questions for Prof Skuman about the Managing Mental Health and Wellness at Work online short course, which we're proud to release very shortly here at USB Ed, it's going live on the 18th of May. Please chat to Prof. Renata Skuman in the chat box. If you'd like more information about the course, Dr. Johan Swanepoel, who's the head of digital, is also available online in the chat box. Thank you for joining our Quick Connect webinar in which we're introducing our new online short courses. Um, we have covered a whole variety of short courses up to up to date. Uh, we've looked at the Digital U online short course. We've looked at Advanced Project Management Leadership online short course. 
presentation skills fundamentals, inspiring innovation, managing mental health and wellness. And we're now proceeding with our last of the Quick Connect webinar short courses, which is writing skills fundamentals. Now, Dr. Mariki Tron Vepner from USB was the faculty behind our videos that we created. And she was quoted very often as saying, it's not that you can't write well, it's that you're going about it the wrong way. So faculty Ilona Mayer joins us today. She teaches business students and professionals how to go about writing the right way. The course outcomes, uh, as shown here on the left, are all about applying tools and techniques, things like critical thinking steps, the phases of writing, and literary guidelines and templates to writing everything from an executive summary to a business report. There are three modules of learning. They delve into the different writing styles over three weeks, with the final week then dedicated to the written assignment. The learning experience itself is enhanced by a whole set of videos that feature an actual writer in the picture um, who's going through the different phases of writing herself. So learners are taken on this writing journey almost with templates and best practice examples to guide them. The assessment experience is tailored to, well, it's tailored to writing and a variety of weekly writing community task assignments helps learners to create what we call this community of writers. They post their written work, they interact and they share learning and insights with each other. We're very happy to have of course faculty Ilona Mayer with us today. Ilona, you've achieved a level of mastery in the English language. Ilona has a master's degree from Oxford University yes. and in doing all sorts of things with the English language. Ilona, how does this course help learners to improve, and, and I'm talking about average English speaking learners or English language learners, how does it help them to improve their English writing skills? Thank you, Michelle. Um, so this course is not really about English language skills. This is not something that you'll be assessed or tested on. Um, expression in English language is of course important, but this course meets you where you are with respect to your language ability. What we want to teach learners with this course is how to write and how to write as well as they possibly can. Because in my experience in corporate and academia, there are a number of obstacles to writing that do not necessarily stem from the student's language ability and or the professional's language ability and does not really pertain to minor language errors. Um, the common obstacles in writing that we see in both corporate and academia is, first of all, not writing to brief, so not meeting the requirements of the said brief, um, using an inappropriate writing style for the for the brief or for the task or for the specific type of writing that the writer is presenting. And thirdly, not knowing what format to follow for the type of document being compiled. And so for us in this course, we want to teach you that writing is a discipline. It has a number of phases and steps that very logically need to be followed. And this course focuses in detail on these phases and steps from the planning stage of your writing to the drafting stage to the final product, which is the piece of writing that you deliver. Um, the course also looks at the critical thinking uh, approach. And that is the, the, the steps you kind of need to take in your mind and on paper before you actually start writing the piece that you need to present, whether it be to your lecturers or to your colleagues, because the critical thinking is, is the reason for the writing and it's, it helps you to, we, we want to teach you the ability to set out the problem or the question that you want to answer or your argument or the opportunity that you want to present clearly and effectively so that you can communicate it to others. Um, the course is not just theoretical, we teach you the theories that you need to know, but it's also highly practical. It features templates and tips and examples 
that you can look at to know how you should be formatting and, and presenting and structuring your writing. Because as you said, our, our, in this course, our kind of motto is, it's not that you can't write, it's that you're just going about it in the wrong way. And our focus is on teaching you the right way. And we do so by looking, by showing you the three different types of writing that we focus on, which is business writing, scientific writing, and reflective writing, and how to approach each of these. There's also a certain degree of overlap between each of these three types of writing, which is why we focus on each three, no matter what your level is or what you, where you're coming from, whether you're a business student or a business professional, because there's certain, there is a certain degree of skills transfer, transferability in these courses. So, I mean, to close, we, we won't be assessing you as though you're the next Ernest Hemingway. Um, we just want to assess your, we'll just be assessing your writing approach and process, and we want our goal is to help you improve to ensure your writing quality is better. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Ilona. And that does give those of us that aren't fantastic writers a bit of hope. Um, the course is, was one of my favorites in developing. And just to let you know, Ilona did the QA or quality assurance of my writing and I write for a living. And I learned so much from the process. Thank you for being with us, Ilona. Well, that brings our Quick Connect webinar to an end. We, um, we said that we were going to set out to tell you all about our exciting new courses at USB Ed. We said we were going to do it so quickly that you could just get a feel for each of the courses. And so we gave you an overview of the aims of the course, the learning outcomes for the course, how the weeks are structured, and a little bit about the learning and the assessment experience. We also heard from faculty members about the, the different courses and just their insights as to um, why and how the course will help you as leaders uh, to upskill both yourselves and your staff members. Um, we will bring this quick Connect webinar to an end and we are so happy that you've joined us today. We know um, that it looked like quite a daunting agenda, but as you can see, when we say quick connect, we mean quick connect. Um, if you have any questions for Ilona or for any of our other faculty members that have presented their courses today, please can you pop them in the online chat. We will keep that going for you for a while to go. Um, and our thanks for all of our faculty members for being with us today and sharing their thoughts about the course. Thank you also to all of you for joining us for our quick connect webinar, uh, launching our new online short courses at USB Ed. Uh, Kerry or you I don't know if you would like to say anything in closing. But my thank story. you, Michelle. Yes, I would love to. Firstly, thank you to you. I mean, this was done in your usual Michelle Volswinkel efficient way. We're actually closing 10 minutes ahead of time. That doesn't often happen with something like this, that one manages to beat the clock. So thanks for everything that you've done and the way that you did it. Perhaps, colleagues, we have 10 minutes left until 12 o'clock. If it's okay with you, for those who would like to stay online, please free to do so. I would like to ask our faculty to remain online for the next 10 minutes until 12 o'clock. And then perhaps we could take a few live questions if you would like to, to throw something at the faculty. Just if you ask a question, perhaps just mention up front which question or which course or which faculty um, your question relates to. So we can sort of get our faculty to, to, to think about it while you talk. Um, and then we've got the 10 minutes. Let's see if we have a question or two. We would be happy to answer. Going, going. Seems like we've answered all the questions. And to close, then just an invite. I've posted my personal email address a number of times during the course of the webinar. Please feel free to send us any questions, any follow ups that you would like us to do we would be happy to reach out to you. And then thank you so much for joining us. Um, we look forward to engaging with you at a different level. Take care. Thank you, everybody. Um, we're going to stay online just in case you have any questions. Let's kill our cameras. Thanks to everybody for being